Well, thank you for showing up. And um, as I mentioned uh, to our good friends over here from uh, Thermtech, that we have a basic presentation here. This is not uh, super duper, we'll say cutting edge. It kind of is just a roundabout presentation on controls. Uh, my name's Ralph Poor. I've been with surface combustion almost 33 years. Uh, actually started out in the controls area and eventually moved into the generators, the endo generators, the vacuum furnaces, the ion nitriding, uh, later in the vacuum carburizing, and presently I handle the all case and standard equipment, batch equipment line. Uh, so with that just brief background, this system here, this is what we would call a traditional basic vacuum furnace control system. Uh, what you would have is uh, these things are disappearing and they're starting to become even hard to buy. Conventional paper strip chart recorder would record temperature, uh, a load thermal couple or two, maybe you might even have five or six load thermal couples, and it would record vacuum level. We would have a uh, conventional ramp soak programmer. So this is going to bring the furnace up in temperature at a certain ramp rate, uh, soak at a various uh, interim temperatures, bring you up to final temperature, and activate a segment to start cooling. We'd have a conventional vacuum instrument, perhaps made by a labeled uh, Varian, MKS, Televac. Uh, those are kind of the primary guys out there that make this. And uh, sometimes these might just have one vacuum sensor. Sometimes they'll have multiple vacuum sensors. Uh, a high limit for uh, protecting the furnace if we were to have a runaway temperature condition. This furnace had a uh, flow controller for partial pressure flow control of hydrogen. Um, and that's kind of an unusual situation. And then a whole bunch of conventional lights, conventional push buttons to operate the furnace manually or to start the cycle, silence an alarm horn. So we might have a switch to turn on the vacuum pump, pull in the motor starters. We might have some switches to uh, do a manual backfill, do a manual cooling. So real basic system, a work ready bell and an alarm horn. And then inside, probably some relays in this particular older design. But there's nothing wrong with it. There's no program to forget. There's no trouble, you know, simplified troubleshooting. It's got a lot of things going for it. Well, I mentioned the Honeywell uh, DCP 550. There's also 551. Uh, still available. It's been around for, my God, probably 15 years. It's a good product, simple. Um, what else is out there? Eurotherm makes a model 2704, and they also have a simpler one, a 3500. But the 2704, um, similar to the 551, and also similar to Yokogawa's UP55, these have uh, one or two channels. Usually you would have just one channel, unless you were trying to have some type of pressure control loop track the, uh, uh, the temperature. They've got some sort of recipe storage, and they're typically segment-based, so you can have uh, long, complicated heat treat cycles, and they kind of chew up your recipes that way. What's unique about the Eurotherm model is this will interface directly with um, Pirani gauges, and so you can eliminate the traditional vacuum instrument if you want it to and hook directly into uh, the number of, they, they pretty much have curves in here for everybody's Pirani gauges. Uh, so that's, that's a nice little advantage of this product. It's an older model, and my guess is this is going to go away in a few years and get replaced with something that looks more like their Nano DAC or something on that order. So this, again, are the simple, typical controllers. Um, SSI's probably got one, too. And uh, there's other people out there, but this is kind of who the ones are that we would normally use. Well then, what could be in the cabinet? Um, could be relays, as I mentioned, or we might put 
a traditional small little PLC. This is an Allen Bradley uh, MicroLogic. And what would you use it for? Well, actually, it's going to run the cycle framework for the vacuum furnace itself. So it would control the vacuum pump, control the motor starters for the blower and the roughing pump. It would control the evac valves. You would have interlocks in here to prevent the heating system from turning on until you're down to a hard vacuum. And if you traditionally operate a vacuum furnace, you'll know as you start to heat, it'll outgas the load. The vacuum levels will shoot up. And so these systems will interrupt the heat based on these vacuum levels. It'll activate a backfill for cooling of either nitrogen or argon, typically. It'll activate the cooling blower or internal fan during the cooling segment. After the cycle's done, typically you'll vent the nitrogen automatically with a motorized valve or a solenoid valve. These will detect alarm conditions, and they'll also monitor pressure levels, partial pressure control, monitor flow switches. Many of the items on the vacuum furnace are water-cooled, and we want to make sure that we monitor either water pressure switches, utility pressure switches for nitrogen or argon, flow through a transformer for the heating system. So we'll typically use a PLC to do those types of things, but people really aren't interacting with the PLC directly. Well, this is a typical single chamber cycle. Uh, you'd load the furnace. The furnace is cold. Traditionally, when you load it, since it's cooled from the last cycle, you'll hit a cycle start push button. And whether you have relays, a PLC, or one of the other systems we'll talk, of, talk about, you'll traditionally pump down perhaps to 50 microns. Uh, this is an adjustable setting. And in the case of that first system I showed you, that setting is in that vacuum instrument. So if you want to change it from 50 microns to 100, you need to know how to get into the vacuum instrument to change a switch contact. Other systems might have the pump down to in the recipe. So after we pump down um, to, to 50 microns or so, if the furnace is equipped with a diffusion pump and your recipe wants to activate the diffusion pump, a series of valves will close and open, and now you'll pump down to maybe 10 to the minus 6 range. So three more octaves below 50 microns. Once you get down there, the heating system kicks on. Now typically, as I mentioned earlier, as you heat, um, contamination that's on the parts, whether it's wash solution, whether it's cutting fluids, whether it's uh, grease or fingerprints or who knows what, causes the vacuum levels to shoot up. If you're heating too quickly, It'll shoot up perhaps over five or 600 microns. You'll shut down the heat, and now you have to start the whole pump down sequence all over again. What people will do often to prevent this cycling, because it really shortens the cycle or lengthens the cycle, is that they'll ramp up at a slower rate to prevent the outgassing from shooting the vacuum levels up too high, shutting down the heating system, and starting the whole pumping sequence over again. Uh, once you pump back down, the heating resumes. Then at some point in time, if you're going to higher temperatures, and this is really something you'll do every time if you're processing high-speed M-series, you will go to some form of partial pressure control. Uh, partial com pressure control actually wimps out the vacuum level so we don't evaporate certain components from the steels that we're heating, such as chrome. And if we don't run at a partial pressure at, let's say, over 1800F, we'll pull the chrome from a stainless. And you'll start to see it deposit in the furnace as a, as a green tint. So if you have a vacuum furnace and you see a lot of green tinted elements and boards, you most likely have probably operated at too hard of a vacuum at too high of a, a temperature. So partial pressure control is, is typically activated and could either be a uh, sweep gas for moving contamination out of the furnace or simply small little, um, we'll call them bursts of a solenoid valve letting nitrogen or argon in to uh, raise the vacuum levels up to perhaps um, seven or 800 microns. Then you're gonna perform the traditional ramp soak program. So you're gonna 
ramp, you're going to soak at certain temperatures, you're going to perhaps just heat as fast as possible up to 1950, perhaps for stainless, soak for an hour or two, and then start cooling. The cooling cycle occurs by the valves are closed that isolate the furnace from the vacuum system. So the evac valve will be closed. If you have a diffusion pump, the big right angle valve will be closed. And at that point in time, after those valves are closed, and there's usually time delays involved, we'll backfill to the final pressure uh, that we're going to quench from. So a two bar furnace will go up to about 15 pounds. A 10 bar furnace is going to go up to 150 pounds of backfill pressure. And somewhere about atmospheric pressure to seven inches of vacuum, the fan turns on or the blower turns on. You'll cool down to perhaps 150 degrees Fahrenheit. This is all programmable uh, by the recipe. Uh, the system will then vent the gas, ring the bell, you come over and open the door and cycle's done. Well, the next level up in sophistication would be what, what we call a hybrid controller. And a hybrid controller, and this is an HC900, it's the first one we would think of if somebody wanted to go above that simple DCP550. Uh, what this has is process control and relay logic or PLC capability in one box. So it eliminates the PLC and the ramp soak programmer. And, and in reality, it looks like a PLC electronically. In the case of Honeywell, you get pre-programmed screens. So you're not going to have customized screens. You're going to actually just fill in the blanks and, and live with their particular screens. But it means that if you have these on all of your furnaces, they all look alike. And it's easier for operators since they all look alike to use. Eurotherm's got their version of the HC900. They call it the, uh, the Penguin HMI. And uh, this actually doesn't really talk to a PLC per se. It actually talks to their individual Eurotherm loop controllers. And a lot of their products have some logic capability in it. So you're not, uh, you have a little bit more flexibility and they give you some custom ability to program screens that actually look like the vacuum furnace and could actually show if a fan's running or show where a load is at. So similar but yet a little bit different. I mentioned the diffusion pump and what the diffusion pump th uh, does, if, if you're not familiar with it, is, is actually this device down here is a diffusion pump and it really just has a uh, very expensive oil in it that's heated and the process of heating this oil and the oil rises up and actually cools has the ability to pull us down to much lower vacuum levels so there's actually no moving parts in it there's no motor there's no uh, cams or rotors and the diffusion pump has heaters at the very bottom of it, so it's, it's kind of like a um, deep fryer in a simple fashion. And this oil gets heated. This is all in vacuum inside here, and these cooling coils that are wrapped around the OD of the diffusion pump are, are designed to actually cool the oil and allow it to um, pull the vacuum levels down. This has to be isolated from the furnace, and this valve right here is, I call it a right angle valve. Uh, it isolates the diffusion pump's inlet, which is right at this flange, from the furnace until the furnace is down to about 50 microns, at which time two other valves sequence. This is the main evacuation valve or roughing valve, and this is what's called the four line valve. So, when the furnace is initially being pumped down, this valve is actually closed down here and open from the furnace to the vacuum pump. The evac valve is open, so now the vacuum pump can pull the furnace down to the 50 microns. Uh, there's a small little pump down on the floor that you can't see called a holding pump, and its purpose is to actually uh, take away or hold the vacuum down on the discharge side of the vacuum pump. So once you're down to 50 microns, the evac valve closes, the right angle valve opens, 
and the four line valve opens and so the flow of gas from the furnace goes through the diffusion pump through the four line valve into the blower and into the mechanical pump. So it's kind of complicated in how it works from a valve standpoint and it is very important that the valve sequencing be done properly and that valves are given enough time to close and open before other ones are moved or you can have big uh, backstreaming problems and you can do damage to the to the diffusion pump and primarily this oil which is something like five hundred dollars for eight ounces and uh, it's it's very expensive but buy the best oil you can get because because it'll help you get to uh, lower vacuum levels if that's what you're what you're trying to do Well, there's also what we call a Mollet chamber furnace out there. They can actually have one, two, or actually two or three chambers. Uh, traditionally, there's a hot zone on the left, and if you're familiar with like a batch integral quench furnace, this is a similar type furnace for vacuum. So on the left side is a hot zone. The hot zone stays hot all the time, like an atmosphere BIQ. Um, it has then either a gas quench chamber, an oil quench chamber, or it might actually have both, oil quench on one end, back, um, gas quench on the other. There's an inner door, there'll be an elevator in the case of a quench tank, and so now what we need is a control system that's gonna move the load around the furnace in addition to that. And this would be done most likely um, with a PLC, or it will be done with a uh, hybrid controller to move the transfer mechanism, the way to get the load from the vestibule into the hot zone, an inner door is closed once that load is moved into the hot zone, the load process is similar to what we've talked about already, inner door goes up, load transfers into either a gas quench or an oil quench, inner door goes down, and then we start the quench cycle. At the end of the quench cycle, gas quench or oil quench, bell rings, load comes out. Uh, surface traditionally will use all these systems we've talked about, but we also might use a customized Allen Bradley system. And uh, this is kind of what our products look like if we're going the Allen Bradley route. And we'll use an Allen Bradley Panel View Plus for an HMI. Now what we do, now we're kind of into the system like if you're into your smartphone or you're into your computer, We've got dozens of settings, settings for everything imaginable. So we've got time delays on vacuum pumps shutting off and blowers turning off. Again, these are required to prevent vac streaming of the, um, of the blower and of the mechanical pump oil into the furnace. Uh, time delays for all the various valves interlock on the heating system, so this basically says we're going to pump down to 50 microns before we turn on the heat. We can cruise up to 900 microns before we interrupt the heat. Uh, we're going to pump down to this particular level um, before we start our cycle. We're going to alarm if we don't get pumped down to here in 30 minutes. We can do a leak up rate test, and so automatically when we start the furnace cycle, we can backfill, or excuse me, pump down, close the valves, time how far it takes to go up in 15 minutes, and we can generate an excessive leak up rate alarm if needed. And then all the settings for the diffusion pump. And then you've got screen after screen after screen of dozens of settings for every aspect of the furnace, and it allows you to uh, set them up exactly the way you would like. Now, you get into the next level, and the next level is a multiple hot zone vacuum furnace with multiple quenches. And in this particular design, um, we've got this particular unit has four hot zones. All four hot zones have a dedicated PLC for each hot zone. They've got a dedicated vacuum instrument for each hot zone. And then there's another PLC for moving the load all around the system. So as the load comes in, goes to a hot zone, comes out of a hot zone, goes to an oil quench, comes out of an oil quench, goes to a vestibule, there's a PLC that's shuttling all of the load around the system dedicated. You'll typically have a, another PLC 
for running the high pressure gas quench and running the oil quench system and then you'll have a fancy HMI for the operator interface. Now that system also did a process called vacuum carburizing and vacuum carburizing is a whole other layer of control for controlling how the actual vacuum carburizing process works and what happens is you just don't say I'm going to run my furnace at 85 carbon. It'd be nice, but that isn't how it works. So you have calculators and what the calculators do is they say, okay, I'm going to run at 1725 for seven hours to achieve my effective case depth. Now what I have to do is I have to control my individual boost and diffuses because this system operates at saturation or at no carbon where diffusion is allowed to go into the parts. So calculators are used to figure out how long do I boost, how long do I diffuse, and then I'm going to boost again and I'm going to diffuse again. Each of the boosts get traditionally shorter, each of the diffuses get traditionally longer, and in this example um, it'll ask you here's my effective case depth, here's my total case depth, there's my final uh, surface carbon, desired final surface carbon 0.8, and then this gives you the times for the boosts and the diffuses, and then those times get fed into the PLC that's actually running the furnace. So this is another layer of sophistication that's required. And then lastly, on the higher end systems, you'll have form, some form of sophisticated computer data acquisition. So in this example, the computer is collecting temperatures, vacuum levels, pressure levels, cycle times, um, how is my boost and diffuse happening, and so I've got sensors on just about everything. And then this is something you can then retrieve later and play back to show a customer that you did a good job. If you had some problem with your parts, you could go back and scrutinize the data to see if something wasn't right, and you could then go back and correct the, the furnace problem. These systems also collect all the alarms that might pop up when the alarms occurred, when they got activated or silenced, uh, who silenced them, and uh, when did they actually go away. So that's the last slide. If there's any questions, be more than happy to answer those.